Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So we've been talking a lot about derivatives. And in the previous lecture, we introduced the fundamental theorem of calculus that sort of unites derivatives and integrals. Now, another thing that we've talked about a lot over the course of this lecture series is convergence. And we have already established that the uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous. That's convergence in the soup norm. We've also shown that the uniform limit of Riemann integrable functions is also Riemann integrable. And so, of course, you have a necessary question to ask that follows from these with regards to the derivative. That is, if you have uniform convergence of a function uh, to, a, to a limit, then is it true that the derivatives also converge? Now, the answer to this is in general, no, as we're going to explore with a, uh, with a few examples today. But what we're also going to do is we're going to provide a theorem that tells us when we can actually say that this is the case, that you have uh, uniform convergence of derivatives to some differentiable function. So let's jump right into it. And let me uh, remind you of what we already know. And then we'll start talking about derivatives. So here's what we already know. We already know that, uh, so the first thing we know is that if Fn is a sequence of continuous functions and Fn is, or oh, sorry, Fn minus F in the soup norm is going to zero, that's uniform convergence, then the limit is also continuous. That's what I was saying at the beginning of this lecture. And we also know that if we have a sequence of Riemann integrable functions, and we know that, again, you have convergence in the soup norm, then, again, we can say that your limit is Riemann integrable, and we actually can go further. In this case, we know that the integrals also converge to each other. So we established this uh, a few lectures ago. You might have to go back through your notes to remind yourself of this. But of course, you know, we would like to say something like if a sequence of functions is differentiable and we know that they converge in the soup norm to some limit, then uh, you know, the limit is also differentiable. And as I'm going to show you with a couple examples here, this is not the case in general. So let me start with a, a uh, simple example. So this example is, let's say let Fn of X equal to sine of N of X divided by N. And this is going to be for all X and R. Okay, so we can look at the entire, uh, you can look at sub intervals, closed intervals if you want to, but in, the, in this case, it's gonna work for the entire real line. So it's okay. And let, uh, let's say G of X be just the zero function. Well, it's pretty easy to see that FN converges to G in the soup norm. Now, why is this the case? Well, this is just the supremum of the absolute value of sine of nx divided by n uh, over x and r. And since, uh, since sine is between minus one and one, the supremum is of course going to be just equal to one over n, which clearly converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So now we know that we have uniform convergence of the sequence fn to the function gn. But let's take a look at this. What is the derivative of fn? Well, the n comes out and cancels with the n in the denominator, leaving us with just cosine of nx. And this thing clearly does not converge to the derivative of g, which is just equal to zero again, right? So the zero function, its derivative is again zero. Clearly, cosine. It, uh, as n goes to infinity, this thing is not even a sequence that makes sense, right? These, these are not, uh, this is not a convergent sequence to some continuous function. So this is for some x. And let me just illustrate, uh, you know, 
if we want to actually show concretely that this doesn't work. So remember, if we don't have pointwise conversions, we can't have uniform conversions here. So for example, let's do this. Let's actually pick a value of X to show you what I mean. Well, this gives me that F prime is just equal to, sorry, F, F prime of zero. This is always just going to be the constant sequence one, which converges to one, which clearly does not equal to zero, which is equal to G prime of one. So we already show, we've shown here that there's no pointwise convergence for every value of X. And therefore, if there's no pointwise convergence, there's also no uniform convergence. Okay, so that's one issue that comes up. Let me give you another example. Um, and in this case, we're gonna see uh, a different aspect of this problem. And then after I give you these two examples, I'm gonna give you a theorem that shows you, you know, when you can actually say, yes, I do have uniform convergence of the derivative. So bear with me for a second. Uh, let's say, let's let Fn of X equal to the absolute value of X to the power of one plus one over N. And this is going to be for all X between minus one and one. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave this for you to check on your own, but Fn is an increasing, or sorry, Fn of X. So for each value of X is an increasing sequence in N. Uh, and we can also see that Fn of X just converges to uh, the absolute value function as n goes to infinity here. So you can kind of just see that formally in the limit. You just take n to infinity, you get the power on this absolute value is just one. You can do a little bit of work here. Uh, but also this tells you that fn converges to f uniformly on the interval minus one to one. Why? Because you have an increasing sequence that's a monotone sequence. You also have pointwise convergence. And so by Dini's theorem, you might have to remind yourself what this is, but Dini's theorem tells us that if you have a monotone sequence and it's converging pointwise, then you also have uniform convergence. There's a few other ways that you can prove this, uh, but this is a nice uh, evocation of a, a theorem that we covered previously. Okay, so now let's take a look at derivatives, okay? So I've, I've established that I have uniform convergence to a continuous function. Okay, let's look at uh, X bigger than zero. In this case, first of all, uh, my limit is just equal to X, of course, and its derivative is just equal to one, right? So I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm just looking at uh, the possibilities. Similarly, if x is less than zero, then f of x is equal to minus x. This is just using the definition of the absolute value. And I also get that f prime of x here is equal to minus one. Now note, uh, actually let's put a little colon there instead of a comma. Clearly, you know, we've shown that this thing, the derivative of the limit, the derivative of the absolute value at zero does not exist. That was one of the first examples that we did when talking about derivatives. I think that was in the lecture that we introduced derivatives where we did this example. Okay, so that means that my limit function doesn't even have a derivative, right? Uh, at least it doesn't have a derivative at a single point. Now, what happens if I look at the sequence of derivatives for uh, the Fn terms at zero? Well, let's take a look here. So, but, well, let's look at the limit as X goes to zero from the right, first of all. So I have Fn of X minus Fn of zero divided by X minus zero. So I'm just using the definition of the derivative, I got rid of the uh, H notation here. Uh, I'm just using the, the X notation. Uh, the, so it's equivalent notation. Again, go back through your notes, remind yourself that there are two different ways uh, of writing this that are exactly the same. 
Okay, well then when I start plugging things in, if I use the definition of the um, FNs, well, the absolute value just becomes the original value. And this is X to the power of one plus one over N and divided by X, which is equal to the limit as X goes to zero of X to the one over N, which again, N is not changing. We're not taking a limit in N here. We're just plugging in zero. This is a continuous function. And so therefore the derivative here is equal to zero. And you can do the same thing coming from the left. So again, if I want to interrogate what the limit is coming from the left and ask myself what this derivative looks like, well then I can basically do the same thing. The difference here is that I get minus X in the absolute value, one plus one over N divided by X, which is the same as saying the limit is X goes to zero from the left of, so when you, when you cancel out the X on the top and the X on the bottom, that leaves a negative value. And then minus X to the one over N, again, this thing is a continuous function. It's going into zero as X goes to zero and boom. So this tells me, since my limits from the left and right are equal, then I get F prime of N, this is equal to zero for every value of N, which clearly converges to zero, but F prime of the limit, right? The absolute value function does not exist. Right, so this is another issue. So I still had uniform convergence here. And I also have a point in this, uh, in this uniform limit, my absolute value of X, where the derivative doesn't exist, but there was no issue taking a derivative at zero or of, and evaluating it at zero for the elements of the sequence. So you have this constant sequence with zeros where the, I mean, quote unquote limit is supposed to be something that doesn't exist. So we still have massive problems. And, you know, you should think about um, de derivatives and integrals as sort of going up and down a ladder, right? So that's the way I think about them based on the fundamental theorem of calculus. I think of sort of maybe continuous functions sitting somewhere in the middle. Well, then uh, integrable functions sort of go up the ladder. They have similar properties. They have a little bit more properties than, um, than continuous functions. So we saw that right here with property number two. But as you go down the ladder, as you're taking derivatives, uh, you're sort of losing properties of the function. In particular, you're losing differentiability results, right? And the reason I think of this as going up and down is coming from integrating and differentiating polynomials, right? You just sort of, when you're differentiating, you, you go down a power. When you integrate, you go up a power. So that's sort of how I keep this visualized in my mind. But what you should always think about if you're going to use this metaphor is that as you go down the ladder, you lose a lot of properties. That's how you should always approach this. Okay, so then, you know, we've done two examples where things go wrong. The question is, is there ever a case where things go right? And the answer to that is yes, but we need to put a bunch of qualifiers on this. So let me give you a theorem and then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and prove that. And that'll be the, the lecture uh, for this video. So we just wanna talk about limits uh, and derivatives together. So let's say, suppose Fn is defined on a finite interval uh, let's say I and let's assume that each one of the derivatives of this function are continuous as well on this interval. So this is much like the previous example we saw with that absolute value of X to the one plus uh, one over N. This fits into everything so far, right? Those derivatives, they were continuous on your interval minus one to one. Now let's go a little bit further. Let's suppose that your derivative converges uniformly 
on I, right? So this is different than what we talked about in the previous examples. We talked about the function converging uniformly. Now we're putting a qualifier on this that says you're actually your derivative has to converge uniformly. Let's suppose further. So we have a few more qualifiers here uh, that there exists at least one point. Maybe we can put that uh, in brackets if you want. There, there has to be at least one point. Uh, let's call it A in this interval such that your original function is uh, is a uh, sorry is a convergent sequence of real numbers. So what that says is that at at least one point you have pointwise convergence. Okay, that's that's what that is saying. So going back through this, you have a sequence of functions whose derivatives are continuous and converge uniformly. And those original functions, there's at least one point in the domain where they converge pointwise. Okay, so then, then, well, then there exists a differentiable function, which we'll call f, such that your original function converges to f uniformly on i, and you have pointwise convergence of the derivatives here for each value of x in i. Okay, so again, you should think about this in terms of the ladder, right? What were we doing with those examples? We started in the middle ladder and we tried to infer results going down. And we saw that that doesn't work in general, right? I gave you two examples where there's issues here. What is this theorem doing? It's starting one rung below on the ladder. It's assuming things about the derivative and using those to infer properties up, going up the ladder to the original continuous function. So again, if you, you should keep this ladder idea in your mind, but this is saying that if you want to understand the functions, you have to start lower on the ladder in order to go up. So in this case, you have lots of uh, qualifiers about the derivative and that helps you understand the original function. And this proof is really, really fun, in my opinion, because it uses the fundamental theorem of calculus. It actually uses both versions of it. So this is great. So let's let G denote temporarily. Uh, let's say this thing is the uniform, so the uniform uh, limit of my derivatives of my sequence on I. And we know that the uniform limit is again continuous, okay? So again, we have that this thing is a continuous function on the entire interval i, but I'm going to actually say on a to x, and that's because I'm going to use the, um, the fundamental theorem of calculus here in a second. So you'll see why I wrote this, but you can easily just say on, on c of i, if you'd like, uh, for each, x and i such that a to x belongs to i. Now also x can be below i. Uh, I just don't want to have to write, you know, if x is less than a, then x to a, right? So I'm just going to write this with the assumption that you understand that if x is below a, we just sort of swip or sw uh, swap the order of these things so that the interval actually makes sense, right? Instead of saying going from two to one, you know, it, it should of course write one to two. So I'm gonna uh, make an assumption here that you, you are following that idea. Okay, now by the fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC, sorry, FTC, and I'm going to use version one first so that you can uh, check which version I'm using if you wanna go back through your notes from the previous lecture, we can define we can define a function f of x for all x and i as follows. Okay, let me show you what happens here. Well, I'm going to say fn of x is equal to fn of a plus the integral from a to x 
of f prime of n uh, of t dt. Okay, so what is it that I'm using here? This is the fundamental theorem of calculus version one. Remember, it says that if you integrate a definite inter integral, uh, in my case, the definite integral is from a to x, x can be fixed here, or it can be variable, it doesn't matter how you think of it, then the integral of the derivative is just the endpoints evaluated and subtracted from each other. So in this case, I took the left endpoint and kicked it over, so there's no negatives that are coming through here, and I can always say that fn of x is equal to this piece right here. Now, if I take a limit as n goes to infinity, the reason I'm starting at a is because I know I have pointwise convergence there. So I can say that this limit, of course, exists. And because I have uniform convergence of the derivative, if I go back to what I started with today, remember property two here, I have uniform convergence. And that means that that's inherited by the integral as well. So, sorry. That tells me that this integral, if I take x to infinity, is just the integral of g of t as well, which I am going to call this thing f of x. So this is, sometimes we write these little colons as a definition. I'm defining this thing as f of x. That's the limit of this function fn of x. And that's for each x, right? So this is a pointwise limit. Okay, now I'm gonna use the second version of the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So by the FTC version two, I can differentiate that integral term and I clearly have that F prime of X is equal to G of X. That's the second version of the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. This term is constant, this term is differentiated using the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So I have a, an X in the upper uh, piece here, the upper limit of integration. We know that it comes down and just gives us a nice G of X here when we take a derivative. And of course, I'm just taking a derivative of that whole thing. And that derivative represents what I called little f of X, okay? So this is just the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And of course, this holds for every single X and I. So what does this tell me? Well, thus, Fn converges to F at least pointwise. Right, so that's what I've just shown above. So I have a pointwise limit. Now what I wanna do is I wanna show that there is a uniform limit here as well. Okay, so next, let's observe that, all right, so I want to look at the difference between Fn of x and F of x, and I would like this to be completely independent of my uh, a value of x that I'm choosing because that will pass to the supremum norm. Well, just by definition here, this is fn of a and then plus a to x fn prime of t dt and then minus, let's say, f of a and then uh, minus the integral from a to x g of t dt. Okay. Now let's rearrange this and apply the triangle inequality. So I'm going to take Fn of A and F of A together. I know that that converges to zero as N goes to infinity. That comes from the pointwise convergence result. And then I also have the integral from A to X of Fn prime of T minus G of T dt here. And let me pull this thing out and I'm going to work with it independently, okay? Because the, the first piece of this triangle inequality is perfectly fine. I just want to show you how I can bound this star piece now, okay? So star, if I just call it that so I don't have to rewrite it, 
star is less than or equal to, well, you can say that this is the integral of the absolute value. So in words, that would say the absolute value of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value, All right? So we've, I think we've done this trick a couple times now. So I put the absolute value inside. I have a less than or equal sign here. Now what I get is this is less than or equal to the sup norm of Fn, or Fn prime minus G. So I can ask myself, what is the maximal difference between these two functions over the entire possible domain? Well, that's just what the sup norm is quantifying. Now I have just an integral of a constant function one, which is just going to be X minus A. When I take that integral, I can just do straight calculus on this now. Fn prime minus G. Now there's still an X dependence here, but the thing is X can only vary through an, uh, an interval, right? So I'm gonna say this is less than or equal to L times Fn prime minus G in the soup norm. And what is L? Well, where L is equal to the length of the interval I, right? And so what that says is the maximal difference between X and A over all possible, uh, all possible values of X varying in the interval can be no more than just the length of the interval itself. And of course that's true, right? And so that gives me this nice inequality. But now look what I've done. I have taken, uh, let's underline this maybe in green. I have taken something that depends on X, the difference between Fn and F for any value of X. And I have made it independent of X and independent of X. So therefore, sorry, therefore, I can say that the supremum from Fn minus F, so the uniform limit, the maximal difference over all possible values of F, uh, of X, this is less than or equal to this pointwise limit or this, this uh, pointwise characterization at X equal to A plus L times Fn prime minus G in the soup norm. Now we know that Fn converges to G in the soup norm uniformly. We know that this uh, Fn of A converges to F of A pointwise. That was the assumption. And so therefore this goes to zero as N goes to infinity. And that shows us that we have pointwise convergence. I mean, that, that shows us that we have uniform convergence of these antiderivatives of the original function F. And that gives us everything that we needed. Now, before we finish with this proof, I really want you to see why we needed pointwise convergence of the original function at at least one point. And of course, you know, it's, it's a little easy to see right now because you can see that it's coming into the proof. But, you know, you might be able to, you might think to yourself, maybe there's a possibility you can get around doing this. But if you go back through the proof, you really can't because you have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, version one in order to put this definition in here and to use the fact uh, that you can pose these functions as integrals of the derivative. So you always need one point where you have pointwise convergence here because that sort of acts as your anchor point. Uh, that's my circle point here. And we have to use the fact that you have pointwise convergence at that point at least in order to make this argument work. That's as good as it's going to get. That's as loose as it's going to get. So, you know, go back over this theorem, try and understand what it says. You know, it's kind of wordy. It says a lot. Um, and it's, it, there's a lot of qualifiers on this, right? It's much more difficult uh, to apply than maybe some of the other theorems that we've shown for just continuous functions or integrable functions. Okay, so in this lecture, we got to talk a little bit more about conversions of functions. And we saw that when it comes to derivatives, things are much more delicate. And again, I want you to try and keep in mind that ladder and try and visualize it. Maybe extend the metaphor, right? Tell me if you can come up with a better way of thinking about this, or if you have an extension that makes it easier to comprehend. This is just my informal way of rationalizing or thinking about these things. Uh, and I, as I said, as you sort of go up the ladder, you get more properties of the functions. As you go down, you get less.
So try and put that in the context of the examples and the theorem that we had today and try and use that ladder example to sort of visualize what's going on here. 